I just got my Tesla Power Walls installed and I'm sort of in love with them. It's just such a cool feeling to know that you no longer need the energy grid for you know your daily life. However, when I started to look into the data, it came clear to me that not everyone should buy one of these. So I wanted to dig into just kind of my experience so far, what I've learned and maybe help guide you on whether or not a Tesla Powerwall makes sense for your home. Let's dive in. The latest version of the Tesla Powerwall, also called the Tesla Powerwall 2, has just under 14 kilowatt hours of energy. 13.5 is what they list. And this is part of the Tesla ecosystem, where if you get solar and you have the home batteries and then you have the cars, you have a lot of freedom and independence based on just the stuff you're generating and storing at your own home. Most houses use around 28 kilowatt hours of energy per day. So with two of these at 27 kilowatt hours more or less, you're pretty good to be a full day off grid. And then of course, within those 27 hours, if the sun comes out even a little bit, your solar panel should charge them back up, giving you this kind of off-grid energy independent feeling. Now, typically these run around $7,000 with installation. Every install is different. So when you go through this process, you have to fill out a form, take pictures of lots of things and send it to them. And then they come back with a quote. I earned these two power walls from the Tesla referral program back in 2017. Thank you to everyone that used my code because these are super cool. And as I mentioned, I am really, really stoked on them. Now, the ones I got were the white ones. These are the standard ones you buy. You may have seen some other folks that received the red ones that were actually physically signed by JB and Elon and Franz. That's super cool, but it actually kind of worked out better because I think the white ones look better. And as you'll see when we talk about installation, we had to put them outside. And it would just be kind of a shame to have these really fancy ones with a hand signature sitting out getting rained on every day. Speaking of installation, it actually was kind of a challenge. The original idea I had was to put them in the garage, but the garage where they would be located was over 100 feet from where the electrical panel is. My house built in the 1950s put the electrical panel kind of on the opposite end. And so it was gonna to be too far because there's a communication wire that has to run and it runs at a very low voltage. So over hundred feet, it, it just doesn't really work as well. Now they can change that apparently, uh, but then they'd have to kind of reconfigure the system and all that. And it just didn't make a whole lot of sense to put them in the garage. Plus if they are in your garage, they have to have these barriers in front of them so you don't hit them, or they have to be mounted high enough that they would be above the standard hood uh, height of a vehicle which is pretty high. My garage is pretty short, so it just didn't make sense. So that plan was out. The next challenge was to figure out where to put them outside. We would just mount them on the house. However, they can't be next to a bedroom. Uh, and so we had to find a place where we didn't have a bedroom and we could put it. Um, and so it, it ended up being just right between the studio that I used to work, that I used to make these videos from, and our, our master bathroom. It's kind of right next to the AC unit and it's close to where the electrical panel is. So it, it all made sense. One of the interesting things is that we had to uh, basically make a concrete pad for them to sit on because it's not, there's no concrete there. And I was able to find one for about 50 bucks from a local building supply company. So this is a tip if you are in this boat trying to do this, uh, like their initial thought was you need to actually uh, pour concrete, you know, go make molds and, and, and make a concrete pad. But a local building company here in San Diego just had one that I could buy for 50 bucks. So I went and did that, worked out great. So in addition to the power walls, they both had to have their own AC disconnect switches. Then you had to have a gateway and a whole new panel set up with basically every circuit from the old electrical panel rewired into this new one. And basically now, the, the grid itself is upstream from the rest of your house, meaning the grid can go away and you can still function. In fact, that's how the primary function works. Typically, if my solar system isn't generating enough power, I am pulling from the battery. So it's really cool and it and it does give you the sense of independence and freedom because in theory, you could go off grid. However, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. One thing Tesla just added was the ability to look at very detailed data about how you're using your energy and what glorious data it is. So in the app, you can see that I have my power wall here. It's currently charging. There's two of them listed there. 
and you can click into the power flow, which is easily my favorite diagram of all time, showing exactly what's happening with your energy. Here, we're looking at over four kilowatts of solar energy being generated right now, 3.6 of that or 3.5 going back to the grid. So I'm, I'm building up a credit with the electric company here and 0.5 of it powering the stuff that's currently used in my house. And occasionally it's powering up or it's charging the power wall. I can dive into the, the history of this and see very detailed stats of what's happening with all these different sources and how the energy is flowing from one place to the other. And until recently, you could only look at today and yesterday in the app. Now you can actually click and look at a week or even a month. I don't have that much data, but you can kind of go back, you know, look at the lifetime of it, et cetera, et cetera. So they're giving you just a really cool visualizations and ways to, to understand this data. And, and I love that, obviously, that, that, that's my thing. Um, but you know, prior to this, you had to go into the, uh, the APIs and kind of reverse engineer it. So thankfully they did this. And one of the cool things is if you don't like these visualizations, I particularly don't find uh, bar charts are good over time series, which is the data we're looking at here, you can download the data. And obviously I did that. <laughs> Either way, I think it's really cool that they're giving you this data and it's really awesome just to see this. I actually made an old iPad into sort of a, an art stand with that power flow thing. So anytime we have people over, I can kind of explain what's going on. It's just a really beautiful visualization. So uh, cheers to the Tesla team for making that. The, the bar charts and the other stuff I think can be better, but hey, it, it's a step in the right direction and you're freeing the data about this, which is amazing. One of the challenges I've found so far with the Powerwall is charging my car. So typically I charge uh, at work. I have a charger here and that kind of fills up mine, but Jenny charges our Model 3 at home. Now she doesn't drive a lot, so she doesn't charge that often, you know, maybe once or twice a week at, at most. But when she does, if you think about it, the Model 3 long range has somewhere around 78 kilowatt hours uh, of energy stored. And if she needs to fill that thing up from, from close to zero, this 27 kilowatt hours stored in the in the power walls are just a snack. That's not even, you know, not even approaching enough. On a regular basis, if you went to work and came back and charged every night, it would probably be fine. But essentially what's gonna happen is we're just gonna just hammer that battery and then have to go to grid power. Now, thankfully, because we're, we're using even less grid power than before, we've built up enough credits to where it all kind of washes out. Going back to the app though, there are a few ways to set up your power wall. And I, I think it makes sense just to kind of talk about these and give you my thoughts on them. I'm not sure I've had enough experience yet to be the expert at this or really figure out what's best. But when you go into the customize option here, you can see there are different ways to kind of use the energy stored in your power wall. The first one is backup only, where you never really use the, the power wall except in the case of a backup. So in the case of a storm or something like that. The other one is this self-powered one where generally all your energy is gonna be coming out of there when instead of pulling from the grid. I like this because that means I'm just reducing the actual load on the grid and I'm becoming more self-sufficient. Now in there you can, and I've set it here to 20%, you can reserve a certain percent of the battery for power outages. For here in San Diego, it doesn't make a lot of sense because we really don't have power outages regularly, but if you do, you may want to set that up to 30, 40%, whatever really makes sense, or just go on the backup only. So I choose the self-powered mode because I feel like it's just it's just really good being you know kind of off-grid as, as much as possible. Now there's also this time-based control. So if I click on this advanced one here, what you'll see is uh, it, it actually will, will learn the peak and off-peak schedule. And so here in San Diego, as well as many other parts of the world or other parts of the country now are based are, are going to this time of use rating where you pay more for the, the, the peak rates versus the off-peak. Uh, and this is pretty common. Um, and you can actually kind of design that and set it up to match whatever your local company charges you. That way, let's say here in San Diego, it's between four and 9 p.m. are the super high peak. I think it's like 53 cents a kilowatt hour, which is nuts. Uh, you, can, you can say, hey, uh, use the battery during that time. But 12 to 5 a.m. when the, the energy is, is much cheaper, don't worry about it. Go ahead and pull from the grid. Just, just kind of let the battery be. This actually could save or help with that problem with charging the car, where if the car is designed to charge between 12 and 5 a.m. and you use this mode, 
then it may, you know, not use the battery at all and go straight to the grid, which seems like a better deal. So I'll have to play with this over time and see exactly what makes sense. But right now I'm just kind of in love with this idea of being self-powered and being off grid uh, as much as I can be living in a, in a relatively, uh, a, you know, suburban kind of area. Uh, and then of course you have the storm watch, which, which I kind of mentioned, but uh, they actually have a system here that, that monitors the weather patterns and looks for when there's a storm coming up and it will, it, it will kind of uh, prep the battery for that. So you don't have to really worry about it. You just leave that on. If there is a storm coming, that looks like it may cause power. It'll, it'll adjust the, the, the energy flow uh, to, to optimize for that. So that way, if you guys do have an issue, uh, it, you know, it, it'll be fine. So really cool, uh, really advanced, um, you know, and, and, and like I said, I, I, j I just love uh, this concept of being off grid or, you know, kind of as independent as I can be. So speaking of going off grid, it definitely is possible with solar panels and batteries, but the cost of being connected to the grid and having it as a reliable backup is pretty low. It's 10 bucks a month. And for me, that that's something that that's worth it. You know, it's cheaper than Netflix and a lot of other things you'd probably spend money on. And it gives you reliable backup power. But another thing you could do is if you don't have solar right now, you can take advantage of the federal 30% tax credit, the federal ITC it's called, and bundle this in. So you would actually get 30% off the cost of your power wall making the economics much more palatable, much better, much you know more in your favor versus just buying them outright where honestly the economics don't make a lot of sense for most people. Let's look at my actual utility bill from last year and just kind of see how this would shake out without the power walls, but with solar. Now, most months I actually did not produce uh, more than 100% of the power that I consumed. So I was still using the grid, even though I had a relatively large uh, solar system on, on my house. but you know, due to the power company giving me a $500 credit for having solar, I ended up not owing anything for all of last year other than that $10 a month connection fee, which is kind of a separate thing that you just have to pay for. And the reason this works is because of net energy metering. Now, NEM is a sort of controversial topic. There were some, some recent changes to it, but in the end, well, the way it works is you sell back or you, you know, give back energy that is in excess of whatever you're consuming at that moment. So what you do is you kind of use the grid as a battery here and you give them that excess storage. And then when the sun goes down and your solar panels are no longer working, you essentially buy it back. You use those credits. So if you're generating more energy than you're consuming, you have a negative balance. In general, this is a super common thing that makes the economics of the power walls really not worth it for most people. Now you may be wondering, hey, do I have net energy metering? Well, I'll put a link to that uh, to a website there that'll that'll let you know. But 38 states plus a lot of the territories and provinces of the United States offer this. So chances are you do. So in that case, when you have solar and net energy metering, it doesn't really make hardly any sense to actually put your money into this, except for one case I'll talk about in a second. But let's assume you don't have solar right now, you could actually benefit from this. And a recent Stanford study showed that across the, the warranty period, the 10 year warranty that you get on the power walls, if your average per kilowatt hour price is above 13.9 cents, you would at least break even, if not come out you know, well ahead. Now that comes out to about 12 states in the United States. Some of the places with the most expensive electricity are the ones you can imagine, Hawaii of course being number one as always. So in those places, if you don't have solar, this could make a lot of sense by doing what, you know, I like to call rate arbitrage. Another term you may see out there is called peak shaving, where essentially when you have the lowest uh, time of use rating, the cheapest electricity, you fill these up. And then during the highest, the peak time, you, you live off of them. And that was in the app where I showed you that customize, where it'll actually figure that out for you. You just kind of go in and tell it when is the expensive, you know, the peak rates versus the off peak rates. But that other case where it does make sense is if you live somewhere that have regular power outages. So in the United States, this is kind of the, the, the sub-Atlantic area, the south that is on the coastal side where hurricanes regularly come and you know knock out power or cause other kind of problems like that. These things could be really beneficial for you. You know, It could literally be the difference between life and death in some cases. There are a lot of cases and a lot of people in the world that live in areas with kind of uh, insecure or, or, or unstable electricity grids. And so if you live in one of those places, this could be something that, whether or not the economics make a whole lot of sense, 
having energy when the grid is down and that being a regular thing is totally going to be worth it for you. So it's not one of those things where you're just looking about looking to save money. You're looking to just have a better, a better quality of life with this. And this definitely offers you that opportunity. And lastly, I, I really can't stress enough how awesome it feels to look and see that I am really not using any electricity from the grid at all. I mean, it's just, just incredible seeing this and knowing that I have control over how I'm consuming energy and what's happening to it. It really is a great feeling. And so, you know, we're human and, uh, you know, this is why behavioral economics exists because we're not machines. This isn't just a math equation here. And so, you know, that is definitely valuable. And so if that's something that is valuable to you and you can do things like pair it with a solar purchase or get, uh, you know, that, that one of the discounts from the SGIP program in California or a similar one where you live, then this can totally make sense, right? It financially may not be 100%. But knowing that you have energy independence and security could be enough uh, for you, depending on your financial situation. So I'm curious what you guys have to say about this. Do you have a Powerwall or are you considering one? Do you have solar? Let me know if there's anything I missed in these calculations, because that's essentially what we're trying to do here is, is explore sustainable technologies like this and see how they're transforming the world around us through the lens of data, of course. So thank you for watching. Don't forget. When you free the data, your mind will follow. I'll see you guys back here in the next one. Hey, thanks for watching the video. I hope you got something out of it. Now, if you want to dive a little bit deeper, become a part of the Teslanomics community, consider joining us on Patreon. So what we have set up are different things and ways to engage, such as a Discord group, which is like this chat room, that is just the folks that support the channel through Patreon. I'm on there almost daily engaging in conversation about how Tesla and others like them are changing the world around us for the better. So if you'd like to learn more, go ahead and go to patreon.com slash and I hope to see you there soon.